Then the people of Israel set out and camped in the plains of Moab beyond the Jordan at Jericho. And Balak, Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was in great dread of the people because they were many. Moab was overcome with fear of the people of Israel. And Moab said to the elders of Midian, This horde will now lick up all that is around us as the ox licks up the grass of the field. So Balak, the son of Zippor, who was king of Moab at that time, sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor, at Pethor, which is near the river in the land of the people of Ammah, to call him, saying, Behold, a people has come out of Egypt. They cover the face of the earth, and they are dwelling opposite me. Come now, curse this people for me, since they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and drive them from the land, for I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. So the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the fees for divination in their hand. And they came to Balaam and gave him Balak's message. And he said to them, Lodge here tonight, and I will bring back word to you as the Lord speaks to me. So the princes of Moab stayed with Balaam. And God said to Balaam, Oh, God came to Balaam and said, who are these men with you? And Balaam said to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent to me, saying, Behold, a people has come out of Egypt, and it covers the face of the earth. Now come, curse them for me. Perhaps I shall be able to fight against them and drive them out. God said to Balaam, You shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. So Balaam rose in the morning and said to the princes of Balak, Go to your own land, for the Lord has refused to let me go with you. So the princes of Moab rose and went to Balak and said, Balaam refuses to come with us. Once again, Balak sent princes, more in number and more honorable than these. And they came to Balaam and said to him, Thus says Balak, the son of Zippor, Let nothing hinder you from coming to me, for I will surely do you great honor. And whatever you say to me, I will do. Come, curse this people for me. But Balaam answered and said to the servants of Balak, Though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the command of the Lord my God to do less or more. So you too, please stay here tonight that I may know what more the Lord will say to me. And God came to Balaam at night and said to him, If the men have come to call you, rise, go with them, but only do what I tell you. So Balaam rose in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the princes of Moab. But God's anger was kindled because he went. And the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as his adversary. Now, he was riding on the donkey, and his two servants were with him. And the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand. And the donkey turned aside out of the road and went into the field. And Balaam struck the donkey to turn her into the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between the vineyards with a wall on either side. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pushed against the wall and pressed Balaam's foot against the wall. So he struck her again. Then the angel of the Lord went ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn either to the right or to the left. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam. And Balaam's anger was kindled, and he struck the donkey with his staff. And then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said to Balaam, What have I done to you, that you've struck me these three times? And Balaam said to the donkey, Because you've made a fool of me. I wish I had a sword in my hand, then I would kill you. And the donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey, on which you have ridden all your life long to this day? Is it my habit to treat you this way? And he said, No. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel and the Lord standing of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand. And he bowed down and fell on his face. And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out to oppose you because your way is perverse or reckless before me. 
The donkey saw me and turned aside before me these three times. If she'd not turned aside for me, surely just now I would have killed you and let her live. Then Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I did not know that you stood in the road against me. Now, therefore, if it is evil in your sight, I will turn back. And the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the men, but speak only the word that I tell you. So Balaam went on with the princes of Balak. When Balak heard that Balaam had come, he went out to meet him at the city of Moab on the border formed by the Arnon at the extremity of the border. And Balak said to Balaam, Did I not send to call you? Why did you not come to me? Am I not able to honor you? And Balaam said to Balak, Behold, I have come to you. Have I now any power of my own to speak anything? The word that God puts in my mouth, that I must speak. That must I speak. Then Balaam went with Balak, and they came to Kiriath Huzoth. And Balak sacrificed oxen and sheep and sent for Balaam and for the princes who were with him. And in the morning, Balak took Balaam and brought him up to Bamoth Baal. And from there, he saw a fraction of the people. Thus ends the reading of God's word. In 2008, the Grammy Award for Best Music Video went to a posthumously produced Johnny Cash song entitled, God's Gonna Cut You Down. It was Justin Timberlake who conceived the idea and Rick Rubin uh, filmed it. Here was the idea. Catching 40 celebrities' unrehearsed initial reactions to Johnny Cash's rendition of God's Gonna Cut You Down. The only thing that tied them all together was they were wearing black and in honor of Johnny Cash. Now, you would recognize the celebrities if I listed them, but while listening to Johnny Cash sing this line, sooner or later God will cut you down, one celeb is wearing a cross, one is reading his Bible, one is gazing upward, one is walking through a cemetery, one is crying. Johnny Cash was known to each of them, but the Lord was not. What are we to make of this? Non-Christians, worldly ones, allowing their image to be the backdrop of this lyric, what's done in the dark will be brought to the light. The highest of the high to the lowest of the low know that their sin will find them out. They will have to answer for their deeds before a holy God. So they might as well bow now, but often they don't. Running away from God is foolish, especially for those like those in this video who have publicly acknowledged that they know the truth that God will eventually cut them down. And in the passage before us today, we read of an angel who was ready to cut down, ready to cut down a prophet, a prophet conversant with God, because that prophet's purpose was not right. When are we most likely to cheer such an angel ready to take revenge with raised sword? Well, when our enemies intend us deep harm, failure, and spiritual loss. We long for the justice of God when in a human court or the court of the church, wicked ones seek the life of the godly. Why would they do that? Because God blesses his people and the world covets and hates and seeks to destroy. But the world doesn't merely want to steal or murder, no. They want to steal and murder and be counted righteous for doing so. That is what Balaam was seeking. Metaphysical imprimatur to kill the Israelites. In other words, God's blessing on cursing God's people. I'll give Balaam this. He knows that forces beyond the physical are in play. Israel moves forward with the blessing of God, it seems. Balaam wants them stopped with the cursing of God. Have you ever felt someone was against you? 
They wanted you to fall. Have you ever worried that God might be on their side? That your enemy might sway God to be against you? Or that your true wicked identity might be revealed and God might indeed turn away from you? Do not fear. God has redeemed you. You were evil. You were bought with a price. And no one can outbid the price that has been paid for you. And the powers that be on this earth have a lot of money. And so they think that they can sway spiritual matters with their money, but they can't. Point number one, any attempt to curse God's people will be thwarted, so bow to him instead. Any attempt to curse God's people will be thwarted, so bow to him instead while there's yet time. Bow. What does bow mean? Bow means worship. Uh, It means worship God. Don't run from him. Don't seek to trick him with outward obedience, but inward reticence. Don't try to take his blessings without taking him. Fall before him. You might think, oh, this is about someone wanting to curse God's people. I would never curse God's people. Well, here's a test for you. Take the blessings that you have from God, that you're currently getting from God's people, and cut them in half. Then cut them in half again. Then watch them prosper while you flounder. And then listen to their critique of your sinful lifestyle. Will you curse God's people then? For some, it takes a lot less than that for people to distance themselves from God's people, to refrain from worshiping with God's people, to not heed God's people's warnings. I pray it may not be so for you, because it will be thwarted. You won't be able to get God's people back for what they've done to you. A lot of people live their lives deconverting. They've been so hurt by God's church, and they seek to ruin her and shame her. But they will not be able to maintain the moral high ground, so they should bow, and so should you. Next point. God's truth alone should be in a prophet's mouth. We see this over and over again. This truth said from Balaam's lips, verse 8, verse 13, verse 18, verse 38. And so let me make an application specifically to those of you who are in the regular habit of speaking God's word. Pastors, elders, fathers, heads of household. Never use it to tear down or attack. This is what Balaam was contemplating doing. His words would make you think that he only intends to say what God has said, yet he doesn't inquire of the Lord. Or the, the Lord has already told him he intends to bless this people. He knows, Balaam knows that Balak only wants to hear one thing, and he's already heard this negative answer from the Lord, and that should be the end of the story, but it isn't. The negotiation proceeds, and the rewards increase. And Balaam goes with the emissaries. Balaam's words serve as a critique against all future false prophets of Israel. This is a pagan prophet, and yet he speaks more seriously about what he should say than most of the prophets of Israel. Speak only what God says. Too often in Israel's history, the prophets lied to the Israelites, telling them what they wanted to hear, what they were paid to say, and in so doing, those prophets became a curse to Israel. You see, people of God, if you have already decided what you want to hear and then pay someone to tell that to you, you are cursed. You'll never be able to hear something that you don't want to hear. You won't be able to hear the truth. We're all tempted to say, did God really say? When it comes to our pet sins, or the sins of our closest friends, children, relatives, benefactors. May it not be so with you. Let us speak God's truth alone. And here's how you can help God's word alone to be in a prophet's mouth. Listen to God's word and heed it. 
Because if prophets get the impression you will demonetize them if you talk about subject X from God's word, they'll be tempted to tell you just what you want to hear. Now, they will be held accountable for their words, but you will not be helping yourself if you take offense at legitimate teaching from God's word. Next point. God sees truly what's in a prophet's heart. God sees truly what's in a prophet's heart. Look at verse 22. But God's anger was kindled because he went, and the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as his adversary. Why did God oppose Balaam when he heads on his way to Balak after God told him to do so? Did God change his mind? No. God can see that Balaam wants to get paid and get honored by the Moabites. We can see a little bit of uh, Balaam's heart when he gets so frustrated with his donkey. He wants to get to Balak. But even if that's understandable, look, look at verse 34. He says, I did not know that you stood in the road against me. He's not apologizing for his sinful intent. He's apologizing for unwittingly going against the Lord. Then he says, if it's evil, I'll turn back. If it's evil, is it still unknown to you? It's patently obvious that the Lord is associated with the Israelites and he wants to bless them. It's obvious that he will curse those who curse his people. But Balaam says, if it's evil. Beware of prophets and people who put a question mark where there should be a period. Beware of prophets and people who excuse their sin by saying, oh, I, I didn't know that I was going directly against God. The Lord sees our hearts. You can confuse and bamboozle a human saying, I didn't know. But you cannot confuse God. He knows what's in your mind. He sees what's in your heart. And if you think your heart is so hidden, hear what Jesus says. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. You cannot hide forever. You will reveal what is in your heart as soon as you open your mouth. God sees truly what's in a prophet's heart, what's in a person's heart, even if they were outwardly obeying his commands. You've been warned. Next point, God's anger is kindled if we seek gain at the expense of God's people. God's anger is kindled, we saw in verse 22, if we seek gain, if anyone seeks gain at the expense of God's people. Why is Balaam acting how he does? Why, why is he acknowledging that he must only speak what God tells him and then proceeding toward Balak, who only wants to hear one predetermined message? What could motivate Balaam to do such a thing? Money. Balak calls it honor. Verse 37, Balak says, am I not able to honor you? And all that Balaam has to do is say some religious word against God's people, prophesy their downfall, and then leave town. Far richer. And what's God's reaction to this? Uh, Balaam, everybody wants money. That's understandable that you'd be motivated to lie for a bribe. No. The scripture tells us God gets angry. Verse 22, did you know that God gets angry in real time? He's allowed to, and he can still get angry. Don't test him. People speaking God's word never use it for personal gain, especially not when someone loses that you might win. And you might say, isn't that what pastors do as a matter of course? Not necessarily. Scripture says that uh, ministers are worthy of double honor, so pay them, but don't tempt them with too much money either. I was thankful for the advice that I received when I first articulated my desire to be a minister. Do you know what it was? Do something else, Nick. Get called in. Get some other skill and get called into ministry. It's still good advice for those who would seek the ministry. And you might say, I would never seek gain at the expense of God's people. How could I even do that? If you're not tithing, you're seeking gain at the expense of God's people. I'm going I'm to throw a statistic out here. I'm not sure if it's true because the research itself would be inappropriate. What if I told you 
that only 34% of Christians were tithing? What if I told you that only 34% of New Covenant was tithing? I don't know whether these things are true, but each of you judge your own hearts. This is between you and God. Be honest with him. He sees and do not seek gain at the expense of God's people. Our anger is kindled when God's providence thwarts our path. God's anger is kindled when people seek to take advantage of his people. Our anger is kindled when God's providence thwarts our path. Look at verse 27. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam, and Balaam's anger was kindled. The pace of the text here really slows down for this story of Balaam and his donkey. Look, as a lover of action movies, I wish the pace had slowed down for the battle scene. And we got details on how God's word was revealed and uh, how the, God's people won, but that's not what's covered here. And so God's word and its coverage even reveals what is important. So this threefold story where the donkey tries to protect Balaam once, he beats the donkey. Twice, he beats the donkey. And the donkey tries to protect Balaam a third time, and he beats him with his staff. Why such detail? The text is a mirror revealing to us how angry we can get even with our faithful servants, even with our precious pets, even with our family members when our purposes are thwarted. Have you ever noticed your reaction when you're trying to do a job and something gets in your way? Once, twice, thrice? Imagine getting stuck in three traffic jams in one day having three accidents on the way, getting pulled over three times, how would you respond? In Balaam's case, what seemed like nature being wild, it was actually nature being sensible and God being dangerous. Balaam's circumstances were protecting him from death. Balaam was getting violently angry with the circumstance that was protecting him from his own death. Can that ever happen to us today? We're not at a time of miracles. We're not at a time of God's people as a nation state entering into the promised land. We're not even at the stage of the gospel dawning on our culture. So we shouldn't expect miraculous obstacles in our path to show us how to go. When we're on a walk, we should not expect squirrels to tell us God's word for the day. But we should trust the hand of providence is there to bless us as God's people. Annie's cousins have a saying that whenever they are stuck in a traffic jam and they're thinking, ah, we, should, we always go the other way. Why do we go this way this time? We should have gone the other way. They would say to themselves, if we'd gone the other way, we would have died. Now that's a manner of speaking that isn't necessarily true and is impossible to prove. But in Balaam's case, the angel said it was quite literally so. If Balaam had continued on his merry way, he would have been killed. That is all to say, trust the Lord when providence thwarts your plans. Providence puts natural speed bumps in your path when you're on your way to disobey. Kids, have you ever been on your way to disobey and something disturbed your motivation, disturbed your, your focus? Be disturbed. Don't continue in that way. Even when you think you're following God, you say, I'm on my way to follow God. But this thing got in my way. Well, maybe that's there from the Lord. Even if you think you need to muscle through some difficulties, do so without getting angry at your circumstances. Anger only reveals the selfish, obsessed, and antagonistic reality of what's in your heart. Next point, we need the Lord to open mouths that we might hear the truth. Verse 28, then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey. How does Balaam get out of this predicament? 
Beating the donkey isn't working. Continuing on his way isn't working. Roadblocks in his way isn't getting Balaam to introspect about what's going on in his heart. The Lord breaks through to Balaam by opening the donkey's mouth. Verse 28. And I'm sure this episode prompts so many questions for you as it does for me. How much understanding do animals have that have interactions with humans? Could they tell us what's going on if only the Lord opened their mouth to speak? And we're all thinking, oh, Balaam is so lucky. He got to hear an animal speak. But Balaam is not lucky, and he was ready to kill this thing. He could have made millions on the talking animal, but no. The story is told that we might all see stubborn Balaam in his own sin. He's more stubborn than a donkey. Balaam's actions make the donkey look like a saint by comparison, like a wise, faithful friend. And so the application comes before us, how are we being stubborn in our sin? How are we bowling through speed bump after barricade after slam door to persist in our sin? And it isn't merely circumstances that should give us pause. We're getting solid, wise counsel from brothers and sisters, fathers and mothers, pastors and elders in the word, yet we still persist in our bullheaded way. Take a moment to notice what in your life has been spoken against once, twice, three times, and you're still persisting in your sinful way. Notice whose mouth the Lord opened to speak truth to you. Chances are it's going to be a human whose mouth he opens, but be assured the Holy Spirit is involved in opening up mouths to speak truth to his people to warn you of danger. What wise counsel are you getting even now and ignoring? Test their advice against God's word. See if it be not the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, who has moved them to speak to you out of love and concern for your life and listen. Yet in the story before us, it seems as if Balaam still isn't ready to submit. God has spoken to him, a pagan prophet, but he still thinks he can game the system. The Lord opens the mouth of a donkey to speak to him that has never been done before or since in holy writ, yet still Balaam thinks that he can get paid without punishment from God. And so the Lord has to open his eyes. Final point. We need the Lord to open eyes that all might bow before him. Verse 31. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his sword drawn. Then Balaam finally bows the knee and prostrates himself before one who is truly greater than he. He sees that not only is the Lord a dangerous God, as depicted in his emissary, Balaam sees that his donkey has saved him from terrible unseen danger. He realizes he's he's had a near miss with death. And then the angel substantiates the donkey's testimony and holds Balaam accountable for striking his own beloved donkey. The angel knows he couldn't be seen, yet holds Balaam accountable. And the donkey's question reveals how Balaam should have known better. Am I not your donkey who has served you all these days? So too, you will be held accountable even for things that you don't yet have spiritual eyes to see. If you still cannot see that there is a spiritual realm you will still be held into account for it. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. If you still can't see that, you won't be able to open your eyes yourself. You need the Lord to open your eyes. And Jesus says he can do that very thing. In John 9, 39, Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world that those who do not see may see. And those who see may become blind. And the Lord revealed to Balaam his glory that despite the worldly temptation, the Lord might reveal himself to the pagan world. Why is this all happening? Why is the Lord making such a big deal about a pagan prophet prophesying a curse? We would expect the 
pagan and religious establishment to be against the Lord's people. This is no surprise. Are they going to curse God's people? Of course they're going to curse God's people. And we would expect the Lord to be unperturbed by a pagan prophet as we are by a gnat. Why does the Lord spend all this time on Balaam and all this time telling us? Because he's Lord over all not merely the Israelites, and he will be esteemed by every nation on this earth. The Moabites are descended from Lot and should know that this is the people of the God of Abraham. And the Lord wants their knees to bow as well. He will be glorified by the very prophet whom Balak pays, whom Balak trusts. So too will the whole world be convicted when it finally comes to realize that her true king really is Jesus and how safe the blessing of God's people is. So our story began with a, a prophet picked to curse God's people. What would it look like to be cursed? Is it name-calling? If someone was just constantly being mocked, would that be a cursed life? Sticks and stones can break my bones, but names will never hurt, hurt me. Who cares about cursing? But there are real curses there are really terrible things that can happen to a person or people real sticks real stones would you say someone is cursed if they had they were beaten would you say someone is cursed if they had three judicial trials and every trial goes against them would you say someone is cursed if they are in severe bodily pain would you say someone is cursed if all their friends leave them or betray them would you say someone is cursed if they die a felon's death? Such a person would rightly be called cursed. Such a person was the Son of God. Cursed that you might be blessed. The Lord in Genesis 12, 3-4 says that Abraham and his seed will be blessed to be a blessing. The Lord says he will bless those who bless him and curse those who curse him. But the Lord doesn't reveal why. And we know it isn't because Abraham was such a righteous man. We know it isn't because Abraham accomplished so much. Abraham was blessed because of what Jesus did for him. And the Lord seems to bend the rules of reality as we know it to prevent a pagan prophet from cursing a sinful people. Why? They're sinners. Why? Because Jesus took all the cursing that they deserve, that we deserve. He was cursed that they might be blessed. This is why any attempt to curse God's people will be thwarted because all of the curse has already been poured out on Jesus. Therefore, we should bow and worship because of the mercy he's granted, thwarting curses that by nature we should own and deserve and becoming a curse for us that we might see and walk free. Let's pray.